Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Money Matters podcast, the show where we discuss important financial topics that were never covered in med school. I'm your host, Dr. Tarang Patel. Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. On this episode, my guest is Nick McCullum of SureDividends.com, and we talk about dividend investing as a strategy. Everyone likes the idea of, of passive income. Our social media uh, physician groups are uh, just littered with the idea of having side gigs or passive income uh, as separate from what we do in medicine. Well, dividend investing is about as passive as it gets. Once you buy the stock or a mutual fund, whatever, you just collect the payments, the dividend payments uh, as they come in. Uh, most commonly, they come in quarterly, but with certain types of dividend payers, they come in monthly. Um, there's definitely risks as with any type of market investing, um, but over the long term, high quality dividend stocks have had lower volatility than the overall stock market. In this episode, we go over the basic terminology such as yield, growth rate, dividend reinvestment plans, and the pros and cons of this uh, type of strategy. I'm not trying to convince you to use it, but it is a valid one. And it's, it's especially good if you are looking for income in your retirement years. We've heard stories, all of us have heard stories about the retirees who live off their dividend checks because they bought stocks uh, so many years ago uh, and then continued to reinvest them uh, as part of a dividend reinvestment plan. The key with this type of strategy, as with others, is to try to do it as early in your investment time horizon as possible and then to continue to contribute throughout. The power of compounding, again, that we've talked about previously is amazing, but the numbers uh, with dividend investment can be spectacular later on. But as with anything, they seem kind of minor in the first decade, a little bit more solid in the second decade, impressive, really impressive in the third decade. And by the fourth decade of your investing career, they become pretty ridiculous. Uh, that's exactly what's happened with Warren Buffett. Uh, some of his investments now throw off more in annual dividend income than what he actually purchased the original investment. Um, an example of this would be if you would have invested $10,000 in Pepsi, which is a solid non-tech oriented American company in June of 2005 and held it till June of 2015, without additional investment, you would have had around uh, $22,500. That doesn't account. We're not going to factor in taxes for simplicity here. Uh, had you contributed $100 a month in addition to the dividend reinvestment and the original $10,000, you, your 10-year return would have been $42,000, which is a significant increase in, in relation to the $22,500. But the, the key determinant here is actually if you would have done that 20 years ago, as opposed to 10 years ago, your $10,000 investment would have been almost $70,000 without the additional $100 a month. But with the additional $100 a month, it would have been up to $131,000. If you go back 10, 10 years further, so 1985 instead of 95 or 2005, your initial investment of $10,000 would have been $700,000 with dividends reinvested. And if you would have contributed $100 over the month, uh, monthly over the 30 years, it would have been nearly $1.1 million. And somehow, if you would have had the ability to do this in 1975, so 40 years of compounding, $10,000 invested in 1975 with dividends reinvested would be worth $2.6 million. Had you put in $100 a month for those 40 years, it would have been over $5 million by 2015. So you can see that there is amazing compounding happening the later or the longer you go on into your investing career. I use 2015 as an endpoint as opposed to 2019 because it was it's more likely in the middle of this current bull market rather than uh, nine, almost 10 years into a bull market uh, in which every in which the last 10 years have been great. This 
2015 to 2005 includes the rise before the last fin- before the financial crisis and then the downfall. Um, but the reality is, is that you could pretty much pick any longer period, any 30-year uh, period, and you would have had similar trends with U.S. companies. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some variance. Now, before we get to my interview with Nick, I just want to remind you, I am not a financial advisor. And neither Nick or I are telling you to use this strategy for your own investments. And we are not giving you personalized advice. We're just giving you information on dividend reinvestment. Uh, So let's get on with the podcast. Okay. Welcome back to uh, another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. My guest today is Nick McCullum of SureDividend.com. And we're going to discuss dividend investing. It's a type of uh, investing that's been around for a long time. And we've heard a lot of stories about the, the very wealthy uh, people who have retired, with, you know, just collecting the dividends uh, on stocks that they bought many, many years ago. But it's something that seems to previously had kind of gone out of vogue and you, you're starting to hear a little bit more about it again. So uh, I wanted to bring Nick on because he's like I said, he runs this website, SureDividend.com, where they talk about this form of investing. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Let's, let's just kind of talk a, a little bit about you know what dividend investing is. And, and for some of my listeners, I mean, most of my listeners uh, know a pretty good amount about investing, but just, just in case anyone's not familiar, let's just go through the very basic part of it. So what is a dividend? Yeah, it's a great place to start. So when a corporation earns money, they're there's five different ways it can spend it. It can either uh, pay down debt, reinvest in its business. It can repurchase shares. Uh, it can it can pay dividends, which is the topic of today's conversation. You, you're saying uh, five different ways that a company can spend their money? Yeah, absolutely. And one of those ways is dividends. So basically what a dividend is, is it's a cash distribution of profits to the shareholders of a company. For publicly traded stocks, so large, well-known companies like, say, Coca-Cola or General Electric, What this means is that the shareholders of that company will get dividends or simply cash deposited into their brokerage account, uh, typically on a quarterly basis, although some companies do pay dividends on a monthly or annual basis as well. Let's talk a little bit about that. So we, we, in in terms of dividend investing and and a lot of investing, we hear about yield. What, What is that? So a yield is basically how much does the company pay you in dividends each year expressed as a percentage of the company's stock price? So for a really basic example, if you said, uh, if Coca-Cola was trading at $100 per share right now, and they paid out $4 per share of dividends, then their yield would be 4% because $4 of dividends divided by $100 of stock price. So basically, the common sense way to think about it is if I invest a dollar in this stock that yields 4%, I'm going to get 4 cents of income from that investment every year. How is that? Uh, how is that taxed to to me to me the end uh, and end receiver of the deal of the yield? Yeah, that, that's a great question too, and it really illustrates one of the prime uh, one of the prime benefits of a dividend investing strategy. So when you earn income from your employer, it's taxed at your ordinary income rate. When you earn income from dividend stocks, it's actually taxed at a preferential tax tax rate because dividend income from qualified corporations is classified as qualified incomes, which is taxed at the long-term capital gains tax rate. Okay. And so so for most of my listeners who are generally in the higher income spectrum, it's usually you know a significantly lower uh, in the it, I believe uh, um, you know 20% or 21% plus uh, the, the Medicare tax. Uh, and, and again, this is not a tax advice show, but but definitely it's usually lower than most people who are earning in the in the six figures. Um, and so is, uh, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, bias, at least in the past, uh, against companies that pay dividends because, uh, you know, there was some thought that, um, you know, maybe they just don't have anything better to do with their money. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great point. And you're completely right in that many of the public rhetoric around dividend stocks is that, oh, these are slow growing companies. They have no way to profitably reinvest money back into the business to continue growing. So they're paying dividends and that must be a bad sign. That's kind of what the public rhetoric would say. But in reality, if you look at the data, 
dividend paying stocks have actually outperformed over long periods of time. And we think one of the reasons why is because, uh, well, there's two reasons. And I'll, I guess I'll break this down into just dividend stocks in general, and then more specifically dividend growth stocks. So for dividend stocks in general, we think it requires a great deal of management discipline to say, to basically recognize that the growth prospects of a company are limited and that distributing some of the money to shareholders as dividend payments is the right decision. So we think that it demonstrates that management has the the benefits of shareholders in mind and that they're dedicated to acting in the best interest of their shareholders. So that applies to dividend stocks in general. Now, for dividend growth stocks in particular, so companies that tend to e- increase their annual dividends regularly, typically on an annual basis, I think their outperformance comes from typically a strong competitive advantage at the business level. So it requires a strong and durable competitive advantage for a company to increase its dividend every year because in order to pay rising cash cash payments to shareholders, they must be growing their business, increasing earnings, and generating more cash in the business every year. So uh, even though publicly many people might think that dividend payments are a sign of a weak business, the data actually suggests otherwise, and dividend stocks have been an excellent investment over long periods of time. And when we say long periods of time, I, I think, um, you know, the, the people tend to think long periods of time is generally shorter in, in their own personal mindset than what you're talking about. So when we're talking long periods of time, you're talking 50 years, 100 year kind of time span, as opposed to the most short term mentality that people are thinking five years to a decade. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And there's been plenty of five-year periods and even 10-year periods where dividend stocks have had negative returns if you kind of cherry-pick your timing appropriately. Like, for example, if you picked a 10-year time period that ended in March of 2009, I'm pretty sure that dividend stocks would have had a negative total return because you picked the very bottom as your endpoint. But, you know, if you have the wherewithal to hold these stocks for the long run, then you'll generate rising dividend income and returns that are likely on par or greater than the broader stock market with likely less risk. Okay, right. And so um, one of the one of the concerns that people have, and it, it hasn't been really true in the last few years, but it's starting to shift a little bit as interest rates go up. Um, companies, you know, that uh, if, a, if a company is paying about a 3% dividend yield, um, you know, why, why would I put my money in that uh, where, you know, I have to deal with the risks of the stock market uh, as opposed to something that's uh, a little bit more secure, like, you know, a CD that, I mean, now there, I think there's starting to trend into that 3% range. Um, What would the advantage be of the dividend over something that's, you know, a little bit more secure, like a CD? Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely benefits. And, uh, I'll say, you know, there's probably two main ones. The first is the tax treatment that we talked about previously. So if you're generating 3% in annual income from a CD or even a fixed income investment portfolio, that income will be taxed at your ordinary tax rate, which for medical professionals likely earning six figures will be quite high. So there's tax benefits to generating dividend income over other types of income, as we talked about previously. And then secondly, uh, over the long term, dividend stocks have outperformed many other asset classes because you don't simply capture the 3% yield from these stocks. You also get the upside that comes with the business growth. So you may have invested in Walmart 10 years ago with a 3% yield, and maybe the yields come down to 2 2.5% two now, but the stock price has also gone up significantly as well. So even though the dividend yield is definitely the most widely cited component of total returns for dividend stocks, It's not the only component. You'll also ideally benefit from rising stock prices over time as well. Right. And also, um, you know, the yield that you purchased it on at at three years ago, your your actual. So if the stock price you bought it at was, let's say, 100 just for, uh, um, you know, uh, simple math. And now the stock price is at 150. Your yield is still based on what you originally bought it for, excluding any reinvested dividends, which is also another separate bonus. Um, so that's one thing that you, people seem to forget. The yield that's quoted in the uh, stock uh, graphs uh, and data is what's currently happening, but your yield may be significantly higher. Like, for example, when you know, a common story that you hear is like uh, Warren Buffett, who famously does not pay yield, but buys a lot of dividend uh, paying stocks. When he bought Coca-Cola many years ago, um, you know, his annual 
yield now is more than the purchase price of the, all the shares that he had bought at the initial purchase. So I think that's one of the big things that people seem to forget is yield uh, for an individual is more, you know, when you bought it, not necessarily what it is right now. Yeah, that's an excellent distinction. And the two metrics you're referring to are like current dividend yield, which is exactly what it sounds like. And then a similar related metric called yield on cost, which changes the denominator from being the current stock price to the actual stock price that you bought it for. So if we go back to the example we talked about previously with a $100 stock paying a $4 dividend, well, if you bought that stock for $10, maybe 20 years ago, then your actual yield on cost is $4 divided by $10. So 40% instead of 4%. And we've definitely seen lots of case studies from our customers and elsewhere on the internet of people who have bought dividend stocks for the long run and then benefit from these absurdly high yields on costs over long periods of time. Right. And I think, you know, whereas opposed to a CD, you're pretty much going to get that fixed price. So, uh, and, and the, and the, uh, uh, less, uh, favorable tax treatment that you talked about. So, um, one of the other things that people, uh, you know, compare with dividend stocks, uh, specifically in, in, in relation to non-dividend paying stocks um, is the risk profile. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? Um, you know, dividend paying stocks versus non-dividend paying stocks. Yeah. So the, the stock market has plenty of different types of risks. There's, you know, liquidity risk, there's bankruptcy risk, but for self-directed investors, probably the most important uh, kind of risk, especially if you're approaching retirement or in retirement is just volatility risk. So, if you have to sell some of your holdings every year to fund your retirement, then you ideally want to invest in stocks that have lower volatilities because you're never going to be forced to sell them when they're at depressed prices or minimally depressed prices, at least. So one of the really cool things about dividend stocks is that they've generated strong performance over time, but they've done so generally with less volatility, which if anyone here has studied uh, formal academic finance theory it kind of goes against the intuition that's taught at business school. So to, I guess, measure this performance, the most commonly cited index that we use is the dividend aristocrats index, which is all of the stocks within the S&P 500 that have increased their dividend for more than 25 consecutive years. And that's basically a great representation of all of the best dividend growth stocks in the market today. So I actually, in preparation for this call, pulled up the performance sheet of the dividend aristocrats index over the last 10 years. So if you look at the performance figures, it looks good. They've done 16.6% per year over the last 10 years compared to 15% a year for the S&P 500. So 160 basis points of outperformance. And as I mentioned, you'd expect that would come with higher standard deviation, but it actually didn't. So if you look at the risk profiles over the last 10 years, the dividend aristocrats have had a standard deviation of 12.75%. While the S&P 500 standard deviation has been 13.43%. So about almost 70, almost 75 basis points of extra standard deviation in the S&P 500 versus the dividend aristocrats. So yes, to circle back to your question, dividend stocks have, or at least dividend growth stocks have historically outperformed with less volatility, which is a pretty appealing and rare characteristic for an investment. And and does that hold, uh, you know, going back to our earlier discussion, does that, does that hold true for longer periods of time as well? So, yeah, so we've measured the 10 year performance of the dividend of the dividend aristocrats since sure dividends inception in 2014. And uh, that's been the case since we've started the company, but the index provider, which is S and P Dow Jones indices doesn't actually provide data further than 10 years. Okay. Okay. Um, but but historically, I mean, maybe not specifically the aristocrats uh, in, the, in the, uh, making it up, but historically, that's been one of the uh, um, positive uh, uh, selling points, right, of, of dividend stocks is that they generally are more mature companies that are, are a little bit more stable, more of the blue chip type of companies um, that seem to have been stable uh, over time. Obviously, and in individual cases, you can have companies that have, you know, significantly underperformed, um, even as a dividend payer. And an example of that back during the uh, financial crisis, and once again, is uh, GE. GE was a, you know, one of the components, I believe, of, of those uh, dividend aristocrats. Uh, but, you know, things can happen with individual companies. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, your methodology. So, you 
when you say dividend of aristocrats out of the S and P five hundred, how many companies uh, you know qualify as aristocrats? I believe there are fifty six dividend aristocrats out of roughly five hundred stocks in the S and P five hundred. So about ten percent of the S and P five hundred qualifies for inclusion in the dividend aristocrats list, uh, and then. With respect to your earlier question about our methodology for avoiding companies that reduce their dividend, there is a lot to be learned from the statement of cash flows. So if you look at many companies who cut their dividends historically, and this holds for General Electric, their accounting earnings covered their dividend payment, but their free cash flow did not. So it kind of requires a second level of analysis where you have to go beyond earnings and say, okay, the company has all of these earnings, but you know they're there's depreciation charges versus capital expenditures on the statement of cash flows. And uh, are they actually generating enough cash to fund their dividend payment? So that simple second level analysis can really help you to avoid probably the majority of dividend cuts that occur within large cap stocks, at least. Right. Right. And, and, and and a lot of people had said uh, uh, many things about, about companies like GE um, using, you know, accounting tricks uh, to really prop up their numbers. Um, rather than actually generating uh, true income, like you're talking about free cash flow. So definitely uh, things to look out for. Um, is, uh, is there more, uh, you know, now the, the U.S. Uh, S&P 500 was traditionally the, the large metric, uh, large uh, base of investing for the majority of the world. Um, but now we see that, you know, international stocks, are becoming a larger and larger component. The Asian uh, um, economy is is growing much faster than the U.S. Uh, a lot of emerging markets, same thing. Um, are there good dividend payers uh, uh, in the international world, and do you guys follow them as well? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually we do have a research service that's exclusively devoted to international stocks, but uh, it is a completely different game. To be frank with you, so. There are, seem to be strong cultural differences between the dividend paying philosophy within the United States versus the dividend paying philosophy internationally. And with the caveat that Canadian stocks tend to behave very much like U.S. stocks. So international ex Canada is very different because it seems as though companies outside of North America tend to emphasize paying a, a certain percentage of profits every year to their shareholders, which makes sense. But what tends to happen is every time there's a minor decline in profits, the company will reduce their dividend in the same proportion. So for investors who are trying to structure portfolios using these stocks that generate a steadily rising amount of dividend income over time, it can be really troublesome. Now, if you contrast that with the United States, the philosophy here is to pay a fixed dividend that you increase perhaps once a year or maybe twice a year for some of the banks do twice a year. But uh, the idea is that you want to pay a steadily rising dividend regardless of any short-term fluctuations in your annual earnings. So outside of the U.S., there are some good dividend stocks, but uh, among large cap stocks, the dividend policies at these companies make it a bit harder to find consistent dividend growers. Okay. And then and then there's a little bit uh, difference in the tax treatment as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So one of the additional problems with investing in international dividend paying stocks is uh, this concept of uh, withholding tax. So if you invest in stocks at for, that are domiciled in international countries, many times the tax authorities there view international investment as unfavorable. And to incentivize people not to do that, they will implement what's called a withholding tax. So if a company pays you a 4% dividend, to use our previous example, and their tax authority has a 30% withholding tax, well, your yield just dropped from 4% to 2.8%, if my mental math is right. And uh, the difference of that money will actually get paid to that company's tax authority as a withholding tax. So the United States does have tax treaties with some international countries. The most prominent of those is Canada. So if you own Canadian stocks in a 401k, the withholding tax is waived entirely. So that's a nice benefit of investing in Canadian stocks. But in general, if you're investing in international stocks that pay dividends, you should expect to experience some sort of withholding tax on those investments. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's something to definitely be look, uh, looking at there. Um, so now, you know, I think a lot of my listeners have, you know, we've had previous guests on and, and the, the, 
the general philosophy um, has been, you know, just passive index investing. And if you get a yield out of that, that's great from, you know, the, the main components uh, of the uh, S&P. We already talked a little bit about uh, how the, the dividend aristocrats have, you know, um, uh, almost a basis point or slightly higher outperformance with a little bit less uh, volatility um, over the last 10 years. So how, how do you reconcile, like, is, is there a way, I mean, is there an index that you invest in? Obviously you, you run a service that helps people find these stocks. So uh, what are your thoughts on dividend index investing as opposed to, you know, more of a, like you said, like you guys do a more of an analysis per stock? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. We, I'm a little biased because we run a research service that's aimed at analyzing individual stocks, but you know, that's not for everyone. It's a little more work and can be a little scary. So for people who prefer to invest in passive indices, uh, we mentioned the dividend aristocrats earlier, and there's actually a fund that we often mention to people that is, you know, it's the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats index fund. And the ticker on that is NOBL. Now, full disclosure, we have no relationship with the index issuer or anything of that nature. But this ETF really captures the essence of what we're trying to do at Sure Dividend, which is invest in a basket of dividend stocks that increase their dividends every single year. Now, the downside to investing in a passive fund like that is that even though it's full of high quality dividend growers, not all of those stocks are going to be trading at attractive valuations all of the time. So an example of that right now would be uh, say McDonald's Corporation is a little bit expensive and we wouldn't necessarily recommend it to our subscribers. But if you're buying the dividend aristocrats ETF right now, part of that investment is going into shares of McDonald's. So you're going to be buying a little bit of overvalued stocks with your investment. Now, over time, it will probably all come out of, in the wash because you know there will be other undervalued stocks that kind of offset that with McDonald's. And really what you're trying to do is capture this dividend growth trend. It's not a value play or anything like that. But with that said, pairing value investing with dividend investing is very powerful and is really a lot of what we do at Share right. Dividend. Right. And so if... Um... For for you guys, uh, so you you know you you already have an like uh, you've narrowed down within the dividend aristocrats like you're saying a pool of uh, of better more val you know attractive valuation stocks stocks that you seem you know to have more reliable accounting. So at, at any given time, how how many stocks are you guys recommending without going into specific uh, holdings? Just like you know how how much are you how you know how much how many stocks are you holding and then. Um, how do you protect against, you know, even a, a unforeseeable event in one of those stocks? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a lot of academic literature from kind of the founders of modern portfolio theory and all of these kind of 40 pound brains, we like to call them really, really smart people that have shown that the majority of the benefits that come from a fully diversified investment portfolio start to kick in somewhere between around 12 stocks to 18 stocks. So even though most mutual funds or ETFs would have probably several hundred stocks, it's a little bit overkill and it's, you're really fine to hold. We, we actually recommend 20 because we'd rather be on the more di diversified side rather than the more concentrated side. So we recommend holding around 20 stocks. And the way that our subscribers tend to implement that is our main research publication is a monthly newsletter called the Share Dividend Newsletter. Uh, very creative name, I know. But uh, the... Uh, the goal of that newsletter is to provide a list of 10 stocks every month to our subscribers that we view as attractive buys. So the newsletter also contains a portfolio building guide, which can basically be summed up as follows. Each month, buy the top ranked stock in our newsletter that you own the least of and continue to do that until you have a fully diversified 20 stock portfolio. And then once you reach 20 stocks, there's just a number of things you can do. You can either keep adding stocks to be more diversified or you can sell stocks that uh, are less attractive to buy some that are more attractive and keep yourself around that 20 stock limit. So there is some discretion involved, but we think 20 stocks is a nice number for most self-directed investors. Okay. And, and do you, uh, one of the big things, uh, you know, is talked about in dividend investing is kind of that, uh, you know, the, the set it and then forget it kind of reinvesting dividends, you know, drip investing is what they, what they talk about. Um, but in, in what you're describing is a little bit more active. So, do you recommend that investors 
you know, maybe not do drip investing and rather take the dividends in cash and then kind of reallocate them as, uh, you know, into what you, you kind of seem as more uh, undervalued or more attractive at the time? Yeah, that's another, that's another great question. So we, we do aim to be, have as little turnover as possible. So there's this great Warren Buffett quote where he says, when we find excellent, excellent businesses run by wonderful management teams, our favorite holding period is forever. And we, we definitely agree with that whole buy and hold long-term investing ethos. Now, with that said, uh, blindly buying and holding can be dangerous at times. So we structured our investment service to minimize turnover and to incentivize people to be long-term buy and hold investors. But when necessary, it does make sense to rebalance out into other opportunities. And I would say our two main reasons why we would ever sell stock is that it cuts its dividend, which unfortunately does happen upon occasion, or it becomes so overvalued and the yield gets so low that you can sell the stock and immediately reinvest into something that's more attractive to generate more dividend income from your current investment portfolio. So that's our views on portfolio management. Okay. And, and with, um, you know, obviously the focus uh, on, on the dividend uh, aristocrats um, is, you know, a lot of the, the, like we said, the companies have been the more traditional um financial uh, and maybe uh, some of the consumer uh, cyclical type of companies, industrials. Um, do you feel that there's uh, within your 20, are you getting a good representation of other sectors like technology and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the dividend aristocrats and more broadly speaking, just dividend growth stocks in general are highly concentrated in a few sectors and you touched on them. The main two are consumer staples, especially consumer packaged goods companies, as well as uh, healthcare. So companies like Johnson & Johnson, for example, it's actually increases. It's, it, Johnson & Johnson, as an example, has met the requirement to be a dividend aristocrat more than twice over. So lots of healthcare and consumer staples, uh, not very much technology at all. Technology is probably the most underrepresented sector within the dividend aristocrats index because if you compare it to the S&P 500, there's so many tremendously large technology companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, that, who have either never paid a dividend or have not paid it long enough to qualify for inclusion. So we do, uh, we do recommend our subscribers diversify across sectors, but we, it's, it can be difficult for us to do it, do it within our recommendations because the decision of whether or not to recommend a stock based on sector relative to someone's personal portfolio is highly dependent on actually when they joined our service. So uh, we not we're, we don't know exactly what everyone's portfolio looks like, but sector diversification is important. It's just something that needs to be uh, done on each subscriber's individual okay. terms, I suppose. Okay. Um, and then uh, I guess, you know, one of the things uh, being that, you know, we talked about the favorable tax treatment um, of dividends. If, if, possible would you recommend that uh, they you know the subscribers do as much of this type of investing in their tax deferred or you know or uh, Roth accounts yeah that's a that's another excellent question and you know with the caveat that I'm certainly no tax sure. professional I would say that the 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 biggest piece of information that people need to consider when making that decision is what other investments they hold so we talked earlier about how dividend income is taxed at a lower tax rate than ordinary income and how fixed income investments or CDs are taxed at the ordinary income rate. So it generally makes the most sense to have your highest taxed investments in tax sheltered accounts. And if you're doing a long-term buy and hold dividend investing strategy, it makes sense to hold those in taxable accounts because the dividend income is tax favorable. And if you're holding for long periods of time, you can defer the capital gain tax from stock price appreciation until you actually sell. And if you're actually really good at this, you can pair selling stocks that have gone up with selling stocks that have gone down because you actually only pay tax on your net capital gains. You don't pay tax on every capital gain. So you can net your losses against it to minimize your tax burden over time. And that's called tax right. loss harvesting. Right. Uh, obviously something that we recommend as much as possible, because if you can, you can reduce some of that again, especially if you gain a, a loss against your um, your actual income, so that's always a, a good thing to do if you can do it. Um, so let me ask you, you know, we'll, we'll wind down here a little bit, but uh, you know, it's so one of the 
things that uh, is is talked about in investing is, uh, and you being in the <laughs> a Canadian, you may appreciate this. You know, you uh, you skate to where don't skate to where the puck was. Go to where you think it's going to be. Um, yeah, the exactly, old Wayne Gretzky exactly. quote. I love so, it. Uh, the question is, you know, it's been successful in the past. This strategy. Where do you, you know, do you think that this will continue to be, or is it something that, you know, obviously I know you're, you know, this is your, your company uh, and this is what you're doing. So I, I mean, I know your answer, but why do you think dividend uh, investing will be successful in the future? Let me ask it that way. Yeah, that's such a good question. And don't get me wrong. Dividend investing has certainly changed because over time, corporations are starting to wisen up to the fact that Dividend investing is actually not that tax efficient because basically what they're saying is we have you know, X amount of money in our corporate bank account and we're moving some of that to our shareholders bank account and they have to pay tax on it. Now, the shareholders own the business. So even when the cash is in the corporation's account, they still own it. They just don't have access to it. So there's been a tremendous shift from corporations distributing their money to shareholders as dividends to them distributing their money to shareholders as share repurchases. And if the share repurchases can be done at or below intrinsic value, the mathematics is the same, except there's no tax. So dividend investing has changed, no doubt about it. What hasn't changed is the characteristics that a company must have in order to steadily increase its dividend over time. And I touched on this earlier, but one of the big reasons we believe dividend stocks have outperformed and will continue to outperform is that it requires a strong and durable competitive advantage for a company to steadily increase its dividend year after year. A lot of these dividend stocks we follow have honestly hiked their dividends for longer than I've been alive. So that is just really profound to think about. Great examples would be like Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola, Dover Corporation, Genuine Parts Company. These are all companies that have increased their dividends for more than half of a century. So that's not something I'd like to bet against. And uh, you know, just based on what I've spoken about in this interview and what my company does. I'm sure you can tell that it's something I'm willing to bet for. Uh, so we believe, you know, the intuition behind dividends haven't changed, but I will say there's probably not going to be as many, what I would call new dividend growth stocks moving forward. So today in the stock market, there are probably more mega cap stocks that don't pay dividends than ever before. It, in the past, it was extremely rare to see companies like Amazon or Facebook to get to be the size that they are today without ever having paid a dividend. And you can see that in the overall characteristics of the stock market. The S&P 500's dividend yield is at essentially an all-time low. It's it's not exactly at an all-time low, but it's, it's very close to an all-time low. And the trend is unmistakable. It's steadily declined over time as companies have favored share repurchases or other forms of capital allocation. So the intuition still stands, but I think that the magnitudes may differ right. slightly going I, forward. I think one of the key things that people need to remember, because a lot of this is, you know, it seems like companies are starting to catch up to what Warren Buffett uh, has been doing with Berkshire for a long time. But um, one of the interesting things that uh, I think people sometimes kind of lose sight of is that he's a very unique individual. Like I trust when he doesn't pay a dividend, I, I trust that, you know, uh, Berkshire is not going to necessarily blow the money on providing stock options and, and unnecessary share repurchases, which uh, just came out this weekend that they didn't buy as much back as, you know, people were um, were hoping. But, you know, a lot of other companies that generate this massive cash flow that will buy back shares. And then you can't, I mean, at least I personally don't know that they're doing the best job of allocating those repurchases, uh, you know, uh, to the to the main shareholders rather than just employees in, in terms of giving them a ton of new stock options. So the companies that are actually paying out the dividends, you know, have set like it's almost, uh, you know, a, a, um, a trust thing. We're going to pay this much. Yes, maybe slightly less tax efficient, but at least, you know, you're getting uh, a certain component of our company uh, um, uh, earnings, every, you know, steadily. And I don't know that the other companies that we described you know, they haven't been around long enough, but they just don't necessarily have have that level of trust yet that, the, you know, they're necessarily going to do the, the best thing for the general shareholder, not necessarily the high level corporate employees. Yeah, you're completely right. I mean, share repurchases are tough for a number of reasons. They're not quite as well understood. And 
continuing shareholders don't see that share repurchase like they would see a dividend payment be deposited into their brokerage account. So there's all kinds of other issues. Another one would actually be the fact that you need a reasonably priced stock to do a value creating share repurchase. If your stock is overvalued, like say an Amazon and you repurchase your own shares, well, you're going to actually destroy value over time because when, when you buy an overvalued stock, whether it's your own company or someone else's, it's, it's just not a good idea in the long run. So there are share repurchases definitely have more nuance than dividend payments, but when done right, they can certainly build uh, a lot of value over time. And one case study I would encourage your listeners to listen to on this, if they have time or look are looking to learn more is how Henry Singleton repurchased shares at Teledyne, which was a conglomerate in the 1970s or eighties. And that's a, that's a very interesting story of the value in, enhancing capabilities of share repurchases when they can right. be done at appropriate but, but prices. Studies seem to show that most companies are the opposite, right? And, and do it uh, at, at less attractive. Uh, you know, they, they allocate or, or they authorize share buybacks usually when shares are at an all-time high. So um, at least that at least that's my understanding. It seems to be, you know, there's very few people like, like, like uh, um, Henry Singleton. So... Yeah, that's very true. And that's yeah. one of the reasons he stands out uh, so well, much. Well, Nick, thank you. This was very informative. Uh, tell my listeners uh, where they can find about um, more about you and, and what, what services uh, Shore Dividend offers. Yeah, so I'm not much of a self-promoter, but uh, you can find more about us at www.suredividend.com. And uh, if you have any questions about the stuff we talked about on today's uh, podcast, just feel free to send me an email. It's nick at suredividend.com. I'd love to hear from any of you and talk more about dividend investing. I want to thank Nick McCollum for coming on the podcast and explaining uh, about dividend investing. I think you can realize uh, after listening to Nick uh, that it is a solid strategy for building your retirement accounts, uh, especially due to the tax deferred nature. As I said before, I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not a financial advisor. And neither Nick or I were telling you uh, what to do in your own accounts. Um, but uh, if you do pursue this strategy, I, I would, in my own accounts, I do this in um, my tax deferred accounts. Uh, for example, 401k, Roth IRA, et cetera, just so that you have the maximum tax benefit of this type of strategy. Um, you can find out more about Nick and Shore Dividend at shoredividend.com, and you can follow them on Twitter or on Seeking Alpha, which is an investment-oriented uh, website, and I'll put links up on the show notes. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Dr. Money Matters. If this is the first episode you have heard, I appreciate you taking the time out and listening and encourage you to listen to our past episodes. I would also appreciate you leaving me a positive review on Apple Podcasts and also recommend you join our Facebook group where we have ongoing discussions about this and other topics in order to help each other reach our financial goals. Finally, I encourage you to subscribe to our email list and also to subscribe to the podcast itself on the various podcast app that you use in order to be kept aware when the latest episode comes out. Uh, more episodes of this podcast are available at www.drmoneymatters.com and on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Audio versions are also available on YouTube and Facebook. And you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Money Matters or on Facebook or Instagram at Dr. Money Matters, all spelled out. Thanks for listening, and if you get a chance, please leave a positive review for this podcast uh, as it helps uh, move the podcast up the rankings on iTunes and get it, gets it exposed to a wider audience. Thanks for listening once again, and stay tuned for another episode coming soon.